Well, good morning. This morning, I'd like to talk about uh, the, a great responsibility of the believer. You know, when one becomes a Christian, usually before he has obeyed the gospel, somebody sat down and studied with him regarding uh, uh, the cost, the cost of the cross, the cost of following Christ. Um, you know, when, when one becomes a Christian, he understands that it's a lifelong journey. It's a lifelong commitment and not something that uh, to be taken lightly. Realizing, of course, the benefits far outweigh the, the demands, the benefits of everlasting life, the gift that God has given us. Yet, coming with that comes a responsibility in our obedience and walking in the faith, obedience to God and our walking in the faith. And one thing that I think many people uh, seldom consider is the great responsibility we'll discuss this morning. As we look at uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, John wrote, Believe, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but prove the spirits. Prove the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. They were to test those teachers who would come in, the, false, the, the prophets or whomever was speaking, that what they said was the truth. And as, as they would prove these spirits or test them, there were questions that were to be asked. And so they would, uh, uh, the reason was, many false prophets are gone out into the world. You know, I believe that each one of us understands that upon obeying the gospel, there, there were certain responsibilities we all had to live the Christian life. I would venture to say that there is one responsibility of which many often are unaware. And this is the responsibility to be careful what we hear and how we hear it. What do I mean? What we hear? Well, as, as regards the spiritual teaching, as John related in uh, 1 John 4, that we are to test the spirits or, or prove the spirits. More precisely, this is to watch what we believe and give attention to our attitude towards how we approach what we hear, the teaching that we hear. Believe not every spirit, but prove the spirits, whether they are of God. The reference to a spirit in this verse merely means teachers. We are not to believe every teacher but test them to determine if they teach those things which are scriptural. Now, there has to be good reason not to believe these teachers, Part particularly that is uh, that they don't they don't pass the test. That is, they don't they are teaching false doctrines. Prove all things. I've seen First Thessalonians five nineteen. Quench not the spirit. Quench not the spirit. Don't don't uh, don't douse it. <laughs> um, despise not prophesying. Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil or every appearance of evil. Every time evil appears, you abstain from it. So they were not to believe every teacher, but rather they and but they were not to despise the prophesying because therein is the revelation come from God. But as they would list, hear the prophecy, prophecies that would come, they would prove all these things that were said, and they would, they would find those that which are true and valid and cling to those, and they'd hold fast to those. Uh, Jesus had John, write, uh, had John write to the church in Ephesus in Revelation 2, too. In the Revelation to John, uh, we read uh, a letter that, uh, you recall that uh, Christ had John address letters to seven, the seven churches of Asia. And uh, as this one in Ephesus, one thing he said about, he had, he had good things to say about various, various congregations. And one thing he said about the, the congregation in Ephesus is, I know thy works and thy toil and patience, and that thou canst not bear evil men, and didst try them that call themselves apostles, and they are not, and didst find them false. So they were testing, the, they were proving the spirits, they were testing the, the, the prophets, whether they're true or not. In this case, the apostles who called themselves apostles, and they didn't pass the test in the sense that they, they had bad information, that information didn't, didn't compare well with the truth that they knew from the scriptures. So how are we to prove all things? In Acts 17, 11, you, you're well familiar with the, those noble Bereans. In fact, this is often we go to is, is when we study with people, we, are encouraged, we encourage them and urge them to take their own Bibles and read it for themselves and study it for themselves as we read in Acts 17, 11. Now these, speaking of those in, in Berea, now these were more noble than those in Thessalonica. How? In that they received the word with all readiness of mind, examining the scriptures daily whether these things were so. 
Many of them therefore believed, also of the Greek, women of honorable estate, and of men, not a few. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was proclaimed of Paul at Berea, Berea also, they came thither likewise, stirring up and troubling the multitudes. So there, there were those Jews who had heard about Paul preaching in Thessalonica, and so they came up to cause problems. But notice how the, the, the Holy Spirit commends these Bereans, because they studied the scriptures daily whether to see it was for true. And that, that was just one of two things. That, uh, the first thing is that they received the word gladly. Um, so as, as we consider how, how ought we to receive God's word? Well, when, we, when it really is God's word, we should receive it gladly. But then we don't just take the speaker's word for it. We study for ourselves to determine whether or not these things were so, just as those noble Bereans were. You know, Jesus in the wilderness refutes Satan with proper use of Scripture. Remember when, when uh, Satan would say, Make, the, make these stones turn to bread. Well, Jesus always, in all the temptations that Satan presented to him, he, he quoted scripture. It says, man shall not live by, the, uh, by bread alone. That's not what we're all about. But there is something more important to us in our lives. Yes, the bread is, is essential for our sustenance, for our physical. But more important is that, that we should... Uh, uh, Live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord. Okay. So hereby error was refuted by, by showing how uh, uh, Scripture was at odds with what Satan was delivering, was, was uh, tempting Christ with. In this same manner, the false teachers can be refuted as well. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. That's the reason they were to test or prove the spirits, because many had. You know, in the Old Testament, there were plenty of false, false prophets. Um, even during the day of Jeremiah, you recall when Jeremiah was, was uh, prophesying, to, relaying God's word to the, the people of, of Israel, warning them about the impending danger they were putting themselves into because they had turned to idols, turned from God into idols. And uh, God was calling them back um, and, uh, through, through Jeremiah. And in fact, quite blatantly, they said, we will not, we don't want to go back to the old paths. We, don't, we will not hear Okay, and, and that's, that's pretty blatant when you say, I'm not going to hear the word of God. Many people today are like that. Say, I'm not going to listen to God. And that's pretty much what they say when they reject the, 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 the Bible as the standard of authority. That's exactly what they're doing. I'm not going to hear the word of God. When we talk about all things we do, do all in the name of the Lord. Do whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. That's a, that's a song that, we, that is often sung. And, and the point being that, that uh, we do nothing, spiritually speaking, religiously speaking, except that we find it in the Bible. And if it's not in the Bible, then it's not required of us, and we should not bind it upon people. And if it is in the Bible, we need to stick to it and, so, uh, and cling to that. But those who would, would try to, to uh, uh, introduce things that are not in the Scriptures, that's exactly what they're saying. They're rejecting the fact that God has giving them, given them his word, his will. They're rejecting God. They say, I won't hear God. Now, it was foretold that false prophets would arise. In 1 Timothy 4, 1, Paul writes to, to Timothy saying, But the Spirit saith expressly, it's very clear the Spirit's made, saying this to Paul, that in later times some shall fall away from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. That was going to happen. Even during the day of Paul, that was happening. During the day of all the apostles, that was going on. And so they would, they would turn to uh, the, the teachings of the spirits, the teachings of the teachers, the seducing spirits, and the doctrines of demons. Okay? In 2 Timothy 3.13, But evil men and impostors shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So it was foretold that, that, uh, it, that this would occur. And witness, why are there so many different teachings about the Bible? Why are there so many different denominations? Why, if, if they all get the same information, if they all are basing upon their, their, their uh, system upon what we find in the Bible, why are there so many differences and contradictions? Because there are those who have imposters who, who have deceived others and deceived themselves too. What's their motivation? What is the motivation of these false teachers? Well, there are, there are various reasons why, but we see in Romans 16, 17, Paul enumerates one. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them that are causing the divisions and occasions of stumbling, contrary to the doctrine which ye learned, 
and turn away from them. So we teach here that as they, who, how do they mark them? They mark those that are causing dissensions. What do they, what do decisions, decisions come from? These dissensions, these divisions. They come from the various teachings that are not in line with the doctrine that had already been delivered to them. And they were to turn away from them. Verse 18, for they that are such serve not our Lord Christ. Their purpose isn't to serve Christ in his will, in his church, building it up and edifying it, making it stronger and, and abiding in his word, but their own belly. That's the purpose that, that they're serving in their false doctrines. They're serving their own world, their own appetite. They're making merchandise of, of Christians. And by their smooth and fair speech, they beguile the hearts of the innocent. So in their skillful use of words, they are able to fool even the elect. In 2 Peter 2, 1, uh, Peter writes about those false prophets of the Old Testament. But there arose false prophets also among the people, as among you also there shall be false teachers. So just as was happening in the Old Testament, just as in, under the old law of Moses, there were false prophets that rose. I spoke to you about Jeremiah. Even during Isaiah's day, you go through the entire line, you'll find that those false teachers were there. And, and uh, as they rose that we see about, who sh um, as also among you there should be also, and so it was in the New Testament, the same things would happen, and it has, and continues to happen. And as we see, there should be false teachers who shall privily bring in destructive heresies, denying even the master that bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. So as they're teaching these false doctrines, they're going to bring themselves own, their own judgment upon them. That, you know, re recall the, the uh, judgment scene that Christ spoke about in Matthew 25, where he separates the, uh, the sheep from the goats, um, and those, the, the sheep he invites into the everlasting life that was prepared for them. But those, those goats, so to speak, uh, or as it were, had not lived according to Jesus' will. In fact, he said, I never knew you. I never knew you. I never proved it to you. I never knew you. Think about knowing, being known by the Lord. It's so important. It's not enough to know the Lord. It's, it's to be known by the Lord. Okay. And so as they bring themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their lascivious doings by reason of whom the way of the truth shall be evil spoken of. So these false teachers that would arise, their life would not be consistent with what they teach, rather lascivious ways, and people will look at that and see, this is contrary, this is contradictory to what they're teaching, it's hypocritical, and the way, the truth, the way of the truth shall be even spoken of. Those, those uh, men who speak lies and false teachings as they live their own lives, people see the discrepancies, and they see the hypocrisy. And so the result, I don't want to have anything to do with that. I don't have anything to do with Christianity. They're, they're just a bunch of hypocrites. That's what come, up, come from that. In verse 3, and in covetousness shall they be with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose sentence now from of old lingereth not, and their destruction slumbereth not. So as they're preparing for themselves judgment, it's certain to come. But what, notice... What they use, feigned words, false words. They know the truth. That, 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 that is, they know what they're doing and the purpose for what they're doing. And they make merchandise of them. And, and many, you'll find that uh, many false teachers in this world use this as a way to entice people in to hear them and to contribute to their cause, which is their belly. And in Titus 1.10, <clears throat> Paul writes to Titus, says, For there are many unruly men, vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, that is, those of the, Jew, the uh, Judaism, whose mouths must be stopped, men who overthrow whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. <clears throat> and false prophets will teach false doctrine. It's evident. It's evident. That's what, why they're false doc the, uh, prophets. They teach false doctrine. Titus 1.12, One of themselves a prophet of their own, and it said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, idle gluttons. That's what was going around. That's what they were being taught there. And that's what these false prophets are, are teaching. That is of the, of the circumcision, that we, or that is of Judaism. Um, and we see, what's, what are they saying? Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, idle gluttons. And so Paul writes, this testimony is true. I don't take this to mean that uh, it's true that Cretans are always liars. Rather, I think he's Paul saying, 
I've heard it, and I believe it. It's the truth that these, this is what they're saying. Okay? The truth is, that's what they're saying, that Cretans are always liars. Are they? Are all people? You know, no ethnic group or, or nationality has a monopoly on, on uh, liars and evil priests and I, beasts and idle gluttons. It, it, you, you see every, every, uh, every uh, different uh, uh, of the spectrum of, of human behavior, you'll find that it's spread across all ethnic groups, across all nationalities. It's, it's, it's no one group has a monopoly on it. So as Paul's writing uh, about the, <clears throat> those that are saying these things, that are, they're disparaging the Cretans, this testimony is true, for which cause reprove them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to them that are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess that they know God, but by their works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. They have nothing to do with good works. Um, and so they, that the Paul's warning Titus about this kind of false teacher who disparages people, makes, makes blanket statements like this that are completely at odds with what the scriptures teach. So because there is, there is such a proliferation of false teachers, then and now, we as Christians have a responsibility to ourselves to hear, watch what we hear, watch what we hear. Because we can hear false teachings. We just need to have the, the, uh, um, the good judgment to compare what we hear, what they teach, with what the truth is in the scriptures, which involves diligent study. We need to commit ourselves to diligent study, a systematic study. You know, uh, the, the scriptures are very, uh, there's a lot to study. Sometimes it's difficult to understand where to begin, where, how to decide where to begin. And it, because it covers such a wide uh, array of topics, and, and the way it, it's, it's presented in what we call um, propositional language, it's the way we all talk in everyday language. And uh, we, we, we incorporate that every day. And so as we look at the Bible, the way it's presented, we need to build everything up, uh, that is, apply everything, put everything together to look at all the evidence. And so in that, it, it requires a daily approach. It's something we can't pick up uh, one, one week and then a month later pick up another, in a couple more days. It's something that has to be consistent. And we need to have a systematic study, not just an arbitrary approach where, you know, you've, heard, you've seen those that, well, or heard of those that would just open the Bible, pop their finger down. That's where I begin reading. Well, there's all scriptures is, is uh, valuable. All scriptures, we learn for a lot from all scriptures. But it had to have a systematic study where we approach things in a way that, that uh, we build upon the previous lessons. You know, we, we go to school. When we go to school, we study math. We, where do we, we, study, we start with calculus at the beginning of math? No. We start with the very fundamental basics, and each year we go through the math, we build upon the previous year. And so, as it is with the scripture, we also build upon the previous studies we've had. And, and as the years pass, the build, it's just like in the study of mathematics, whether you start with arithmetic, then you go to geometry, then you go to trigonometry, then you go to uh, uh, analytic geometry and calculus and, and um, 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 <coughs> linear algebra and so forth and so on to the higher mathematics, you start from the beginning and you build up from there. there are, you're, build, you're building your array of tools. In the same way as one studies the scriptures, he's building his array of knowledge and, 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 and understanding and applies that understanding to other, other topics or this, uh, within the same vein of the various topics. Okay. So we must be careful what we hear or what we pay attention to. And part of that is, whom are we to hear? Matthew 17, 5, Jesus speaking, he says, While he was yet speaking, behold, a, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. This, rather, is the uh, narrative by Matthew, as uh, Peter, James, and, uh, uh, and Andrew, or 
um, had, or Peter, James, John had a, a, a accompanied Jesus up to the mountain of transfiguration. And as it says, while he was yet speaking, behold, Peter speaking, uh, he says, let me build three tabernacles for each one of you, Jesus being transfigured. And there appeared with him Moses and, and Isaiah. He had Moses, uh, the lawgiver, and Isaiah, the prophet, the law and the prophets, the Moses and the prophets, and this voice coming from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. So who do, whom do we hear? Of course, it always goes back to hearing Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, to all of us who believe and obey him. Um, Jesus reminds us of our responsibility to pay attention to his teachings in Matthew eleven fifteen, and he often would... Uh, uh, augment his teaching with this very simple statement. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Of course, we understand he who has ears to perceive sounds, no. He who has a mindset to learn the truth, pay attention. Because what he was teaching was spiritual truth. And so we consider that whom are we to hear? Of course, Jesus Christ himself and those speaking and teaching the same uh, the gospel truth. Some will hear and some will not. Some of those who do not hear are not content to leave it alone. Uh, they take it upon themselves to impede those who would hear or would deliver the truth. Yeah, uh, we're well aware that, that as, as the gospel is preached, um, you have some who readily receive the word, like the Bereans. In fact, they received it so well that they wanted to verify it. They studied, the, looked, searched the scriptures daily to see whether or not what they were being taught was the truth. But there are those who will have nothing to do with teaching. To them, it's foolishness. And so they'll have nothing to do with it. But it's not enough for this kind to, to uh, reject it for themselves, but rather they'll try to make it difficult for others, either by disparaging the teacher, the, the one that's bearing the truth, or by, uh, ridiculing the, the, the things that are taught because they don't have a mindset to, to understand. But as we see in Acts 13.43, now when the synagogue broke, broke up, many of the Jews of, and of the doubt proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. Now these are proselytes to Judaism. Okay? And so Paul and Barnabas were teaching them. And the, in verse 44, in the next Sabbath, almost the whole city was gathered together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with jealousies, jealousy and contradicted the things which were spoken by Paul and blasphemed. You know, this, it's very much like the, the Pharisees. You know, when uh, uh, Jesus was uh, uh, pronouncing woes upon the scribes, Pharisees, that they were hypocrites, you know, that, that, that they would compass land and sea, find one proselyte, and then in, in, the ensuing endeavor would make them two, twofold a child of the devil because they would follow after the teachings of the, of the, of the Pharisees of their particular uh, traditions of their fathers rather than adhering to the, the uh, law of Moses, the word of God. And so they would uh, introduce them to the truth that should bring them salvation, the way, the, the way of life. Okay? But then the ensuing teachings would make them a child of the devil. And it wasn't enough that, that uh, they, were, they would uh, reject the teachings of Christ, but they would try to impede others entering into the kingdom. Okay, And as we see in verse 46, And Paul and Barnabas spake out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first be spoken to you, seeing ye thrust it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Lo, we, re we turn to the Gentiles. Now this made the Gentiles very glad that Paul and Barnabas are going to now teach them, show them the way, the glad, share with them the glad tidings of everlasting life. But the fact is that they had thrust that teaching from them in so doing, they had judged themselves unworthy of everlasting life. And that's exactly what people do when they reject the, the gospel. They, re, they consider themselves unworthy of everlasting life. That's the end result. So why do they do this? Well, one reason is jealousy. In that case, what, the example we just saw is jealousy over the popularity of Paul and Barnabas. They saw that the, their influence was diminishing uh, over it. Now, in James 1.19... James wrote, Ye know this, my beloved brethren, but let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Be swift to hear, swift to hear the truth. We should be ready to accept the word of God. Slow to speak, slow to wrath. 
but why? In Romans 10, 17, tells us, so belief or faith cometh of hearing. In order to, to, our faith comes from hearing the truth. Anyone's faith of anything comes from hearing what that, that thing is taught, whether it be uh, a philosophy, whether it be a religious uh, belief, whether it be a, a uh, um, uh, even organizations or clubs, their, their, uh, their um, policies, you know. It comes from hearing what they have to say about it. And so the belief of the Christian comes from hearing the word of God. No other place. Our faith in God doesn't increase from hearing other things. Our faith in God increases only by hearing the word of God uh, and hearing by the word of Christ. So belief comes from hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. Or faith comes from hearing, hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. So what is our responsibility? As we consider, we need to be careful what we hear. We've seen that so far. But look at Mark 4, 23. If any man hath ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, Take heed what ye hear. With what measure ye meet it, it shall be measured unto you, and more shall be given unto you. So as Jesus had explicitly, we need to be careful what we hear, whether it be the truth or not. In Luke 8, 18, it's a little different. Luke 8, 18, Jesus said, Take heed therefore how ye hear. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given. And whosoever hath not, from his sh him shall be taken away. Even that which he thinketh, he hath. So it's important to, to understand, we need to be careful how we hear. We need to, as the Bereans were ready to receive the word of God, they received it gladly. And so, as we find opportunity um, uh, to hear the truth, Take it in. This is God's word. This is going to enrich my life because these are the words of life. You know, when uh, Jesus had just finished teaching a very hard teaching. And so many of his disciples turned away. And Jesus turned to his 12. He says, how about you? Will you also leave? Will you also not lo no longer follow after me? Well, Peter said, turned and said, to whom would we go? Thou hast the words of life. So as we think about Christ has the words of life that brings us everlasting life, it brings us to the knowledge of everlasting life, it brings us to what we know we must do in order to be saved. And so we need to be careful that as we hear God's word that we are ready to hear it and, and absorb it like a sponge. Just be certain that we prove the spirits that, they, that are consistent with what the scriptures do teach. First Timothy 4.16, take heed to thyself and to thy teaching. Continue in these things, for in doing this thou shalt save both thyself and them that hear thee. So as Timothy was, Paul instructed Timothy to teach the words that he had been taught, the gospel truth coming from Paul. Paul being the apostle of Christ, who received the words of Christ from the Holy Spirit. So Timothy was to look introspectively, he says, in that he would remain in, uh, uh, in the truth. He remained to uh, uh, continue in those things that he had, been, had learned from Paul, but also in teaching others that when he would, he not only save himself, but also them... That, that hear them, hear him. Why should we fulfill this responsibility in the sense of, why should, why should we fulfill the responsibility of taking care of what we hear and being careful about how we hear it? What's so important about that? Well, as Hebrews 3.12 says, Take heed, brethren, lest happily there shall be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief and falling away from the living God. So, as we consider the, the responsibility for hearing the truth, and taking it as God's word, and taking care of how we hear, that uh, if we don't, we can fall away. We can lose our faith, become a castaway, uh, fall from grace, lose that gift that God has given us of everlasting life. As Hebrews 2, 1 says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things that were heard, lest happily we drift away from them. For if the word spoken through the angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape 
if we neglect so great a salvation. You can look back to the Old Testament that those who had, had uh, been, uh, uh, been uh, delivered from the bondage of Egypt. And God was delivering them, taking them to the promised land. And they, they should have been ready to enter that promised land, that land that God has promised them. But as they had proven themselves that, that unworthy because they had doubts, they had, uh, there were mumblings, there were, uh, they, even, they even challenged the authority of Moses. Um, and so as it was, instead of delivering them to the land of promise, they missed out on it. They missed out on it. So they spent 40 years. All of those that were uh, 20 years and older died in the wilderness because of their unbelief. The, um, and, and we take that as a, as a, a uh, lesson from that, the principle. We who are wandering in our wilderness of this, this world of sin, as we consider the promise has been given us of everlasting life, how do we respond to that? Do we believe God when he, when he makes his promise? And what if we don't? Are we going to turn away from him? Are we going to lose that inheritance because of that uh, d uh, disbelief? And so as, as we consider that the Old Testament is very, very valuable for teaching us the kinds of temptations that, that the, people, uh, the, the Israelites re uh, received, the kind of things, they, that the behavior they had in turning away from God, and then what was that just recompense of reward? Well, many of them perished because of their rebellion against God. Many of them, uh, uh, you know, they were, they were swallowed up by the earth, okay? And the, the rest of them died in the wilderness, never actually having received that inheritance that had been promised them because of their unbelief. So as, uh, for the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? We can't neglect our salvation, which having at the first been spoken through the Lord was confirmed unto us by them that heard. We can see that the, those who are witnesses, were witnesses of Jesus' resurrection, it was confirmed not only by the, the words that they spoke, but the, 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 the uh, exhibition or performance of miracles to show that they were from God and the message they preached was from God. And as it was confirmed unto us by them that heard. Now to them, those, those people, the, the Hebrews writer was writing, but as we read the testimony of those that saw and we look at the integrity of which these, these, these uh, witnesses spoke and wrote, and the life they lead, led, and the death they, they uh, found because of their faith, it was confirmed to us as well. We today, it's confirmed to us, reading of their events, their lives, and the miracles that were performed. God also bearing witness with them, both by signs and wonders, and by manifold powers. So the miracles uh, accompanied these who spoke the gospel, pre te preached and teach, taught the gospel, it was accompanied by these signs and wonders and manifold powers, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So how, can, how could they neglect so great a salvation? And how could we neglect so great a salvation? So we need to be, consider seriously our responsibility to take care of what we hear, and to take care of how we hear it. Always be ready to hear the word of God and, and receive it gladly and, and add it to our own lives, whether it requires adjustments of our own attitudes, whether it requires changes in our own behavior, or whether it just builds us up in, in our knowledge and understanding so that we become uh, uh, stronger in the faith and a, and a stronger example for, to our fellow brethren to be encouraging to them. So, so um, just as we consider the responsibilities of Christians, of course, the primary responsibility is remaining faithful to the Father, remaining faithful to Christ in our obedience to him, walking circumspectly, and walking in, in the, the light, even as he is in the light. And so uh, we um, take that responsibility in, in addition to the fact that uh, when we, have our, when we have opportunity, we share that, our faith with others because as we have been given the opportunity for everlasting life, 
wouldn't we want to share that with other people that they too can have share that same thing, wonderful thing? I've, I've often thought about uh, that uh, uh, one who will not, will not get out of his comfort zone and will not share what he knows about the gospel, what he knows about Jesus Christ dying on the cross, what he knows about how to become a Christian. One who will not do this is like the one, imagine that uh, Jesus, this is, this is, this is uh, hypothetical. As he thinks about Jesus, I appreciate very much the life you led in coming to this earth, having come down from heaven. I appreciate very much the teachings that you taught, showing us the truth, bringing us the truth that therein we can find life abundantly, everlasting life as well. And you died on the cross. You suffered for me. You shed your blood on that cross. You endured the pain. Not that it was so much fun for you because you, you looked for the joy that was before you in saving mankind. I appreciate very much all you gave. And I appreciate very much having called and trained and taught your disciples that they too carried forth the gospel and they endured similar uh, punishment. And they went through their lives just like that. And I appreciate that so much that I'm just not going to tell anybody about it. You see the inconsistency there? And so we think about as, as we have opportunity, we should take advantage of it because we do have good news. We do have good news. Just, just uh, we need to be convinced that we have the, the truth to life and that people want to hear it. There, we saw that there are some that won't. In fact, Jesus said the majority of people won't. But we do have for those that, that do. And so we think about how do we become a Christian? How do we find everlasting life? We see in Hebrews 11:6, without faith it is impossible to be well pleasing unto him. We must first believe that he is and that he's a reward of them that diligently seek after him. We also know that uh, we must confess Christ as the Son of God. Confessing him as the Son of God pretty much says that he is God. His being the Son of God equates him to, he puts him on equality with God. And so as we think about Jesus who said, Whosoever therefore will confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever will deny before men, him will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Of course, we also know we must repent of our sins. As he told his disciples, I tell you, nay, except ye repent, ye shall all in like manner perish. And as Peter told those men in, in the day of Pentecost, when they said, men and brethren, what must we do? Peter had just told them that they were involved with the death of the Son of God, the one that, that this Jesus, whom God has made both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. They said, men and brethren, what must we do? He said, repent ye and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, unto the remission of your sins, Acts 2.38. So this is what we must do. And this is the good news that because when one submits himself to this, this plan, God's plan of salvation. He finds everlasting life. He finds forgiveness of sins, is justified by God because of what Christ did upon the cross. And he has a new life. This is the good news. So if you, you consider, if you haven't obeyed the gospel to this point, don't delay. Be ready to receive the word of God comparing it with what the scriptures say, as the Bereans did. If you need to respond to the gospel invitation, then come forward as we stand and as we sing.